Good morning, I guess. I keep thinking it's afternoon, but it's still morning. It's a great privilege to be back here at Tabor, where I got to spend my first two years out of high school. It was very nostalgic for me to be driving back into Hillsboro. I haven't been here in nine years, because I've been in Missouri and in Denver for, the, for that time. And it's just been a great blessing, and it's a thank you again, Ryan, for having me. What I wanted to talk to you about is something actually very simple and maybe something that we all maybe take for granted. And that is simple communication with those who have different beliefs than ourselves. And I'm going to kind of tie in my own story and my experience here at Tabor into that. And so I'm sure all of us have had a, a time when we've had a conversation with somebody especially when we're dealing with the faith, trying to evangelize. And all of a sudden, it just seems like we're both talking at walls at the same time, and nothing is getting done. We're, at, we're moving nowhere. Well, how in the world do you fix that? Well, the first and foremost is when you're having a conversation with someone else who of a different faith, different beliefs, whether it be Atheists, whether it be agnostics, whether it be Muslim, Hindu, Protestants versus Catholics, it doesn't matter. These three things that I'm going to talk, to talk about apply to everybody. The first thing that you need to do is have a foundation. You need a foundation. You have to start on the same platform. If you're talking on two different wavelengths, it's just going to make absolutely no sense. And like I said, you're going to be talking at walls the whole time, and nothing's going to get done. It's like listening, it'll be like listening to Hillary Clinton and Trump talk on, in their debates. Nothing seems to get done. They're just yelling at each other the whole time. I don't know if any of you have been watching the debates. It's very frustrating. But anyways, I'm not here to talk about politics. You need to set a platform. You need to basically define your terms. As any good philosopher would say, that's probably the first and foremost thing you have to do is define your terms. And it might take a little bit to realize that you're on different ground. And you need to be willing to back up. Back up and say, okay, wait a minute. You're talking in this area kind of with this definition, maybe, say, of love. And I'm talking with this definition of love. Let's come together and at least have the presupposition of the same definition. And then we can start moving. You have to be on the same ground level. The second thing is respect, and probably that's probably the most important thing, is to have respect for whoever you're talking with. When I came here to Tabor, I was very nervous, very nervous, because I knew this was a Mennonite brother in college, very Protestant, and I was a Catholic. And at that time, there weren't many Catholics. There was probably only four or so that at least that I knew of here on campus. And I've kind of, and as Catholics, you kind of grow up hearing the horror stories of how Protestants teach Catholics, especially if a Catholic enters into the Protestant world, Protestant realm. And so I was very nervous. I was incredibly nervous coming here. And I didn't let really anybody know that I was Catholic for the first few months just because I was terrified that I would be absolutely persecuted. And ironically enough, I didn't know a whole lot. I can say that's a little bit different now since I'm a priest. But I did not know a whole lot coming out of high school. And that's mainly my fault. But once I started telling people that I was Catholic... I, here at Tabor, I found the great opportunity and the great realization that there's a lot of respect here. There's a lot of respect. And never once in my two years when I was here was I ever persecuted. I was questioned. Yes, I was questioned all the time. And I have to say, about 99%, I would have to say, well, I don't know the, that answer. And I'd have to go back and spend a couple hours looking up the answer and then come back to him. It was a long process. But I was never persecuted. Never. And uh, like, I, like Ryan said, I was a member of the college choir. 
And with that, I, we got to go to park. I know some of you are probably here in the choir, and you've been to park. Probably going there, hopefully again, uh, this coming spring break. And that was the first Catholic church ever that the choir was a part, that sang in, and which was kind of mind-blowing because that's what Catholic churches were built for, was acoustics, because there were no microphones. And But at the same time, it provided me a great opportunity to evangelize and for at least an understanding. People would come to me and ask me, hey, Luke, can you uh, take me to Pilsen? That's where I went to Mass. I'm like, sure, great, fine. Just don't really ask me anything exactly like in detail of what's going on, at least theologically, because I probably don't know that. But I can at least tell you generally what's happening. And I was super excited because that just went to show the great kind of atmosphere that, was, that is here at Tabor. And that's why I love it so much. Even when I, after I uh, left Tabor and went to seminary, I would tell people from Benedictine College, I think Tabor plays Benedictine like in soccer and stuff, if I'm not mistaken. I would still tell those guys that if I were to leave seminary, I would come straight back here. I would have come straight back here instead of to a Catholic college because of the love and respect and the faith in God that was here and that is here. And that's why Tabor has left such a lasting impression on me. And if it wasn't for my experience here, I don't know where I would be yet as far as being able to communicate uh, with people of non-Catholic faith. Tabor definitely provided me a foundation in order to approach, especially Protestants, with a great respect. And I know there's a lot of stuff out there floating out there, especially on the Internet, that they try and say what the Catholic Church teaches, but it's really not what the Catholic Church teaches. And so the internet can sometimes fill you with false teachings about the Catholic Church, but I'm not here to really talk about that either. So, respect. Respect where, everybody, where the other person is coming from. If you do that, that one simple thing, if you have respect for the other person, are willing to look them in the eye as a child of God... You've won half the battle because after you walk away from your discussion, whether you won or not or whether it was just, just a flat-out discussion, you will have still the respect of the other person and probably you will have gained even more respect for them as well. So whenever I go into discussions, I immediately start with, this is... First and foremost, a child of God. And as I listen to them, I listen, in, listen intently. This is what everybody needs to do, is listen intently of where they are coming from. Because we come from very different backgrounds. From Texas, California. I always left when I would, my freshman year, because people would come from California to here and be like, what in the world do you do in a town of 3,000? Where's your Macy's? It was... Well, there might be one in Wichita. How far is that? 45 minutes. So, but nonetheless, the respect that was garnered uh, with my experience here at Tabor, I have uh, great appreciation for. And hopefully you all have had these experiences. And maybe it is some, you've had a discussion with somebody who you don't necessarily like. Like, liking a person and respecting a person are two totally different things. You don't have to like a person to respect them. Respecting a person goes to a much deeper level because, like I've said, they are a child of God. And because of that being made in the image and likeness of God, they deserve the respect that is due because of that simple fact. And they might say things that are hurtful, but... That's when you just have to basically take it and being like, all right, maybe they're not respecting me, but I can at least respect them. 
And that will prevent you from getting into a very hateful, hateful argument. I come back to the example of Trump and Clinton. There is a lot of hate going on. A lot of hate. Because they do not respect each other. One little bit. And it's sad that two people who are running for our presidency don't, can't even respect the other person who's running. And my brothers and sisters, we don't need any more hate in this world. There's enough of it to go around already. So I beg of you, and I plead that you kind of change your outlook of when you're having these discussions, these Um, debates with other people. Don't let it get to hate. When you let it get to hate, the devil has won. Jesus has not won. The devil has won. And that's the last thing that we ever want, is the devil to win. Granted, the devil can never win because Christ, praise be Jesus, was raised from the dead, saved our sins, all that good stuff. I don't say that haphazardly just because I just don't care but. Anyways, I do care. It's a great care. I want to become a priest if I didn't believe in that solely. Respect. The next thing is when in the world is enough enough? When is enough enough? Like I said, if you get to the point of being hateful to each other, where you're talking at walls because if you, you haven't set that foundation, you haven't come into discussion respecting one another, you need to know when to walk away because nothing's going to happen worse, even more bad things are actually probably going to happen as a result. And who knows, maybe they'll go back to their friends and tarnish your name Just because of that one conversation that you had. And that's not what you want. When to walk away. If you're in a discussion and you do realize that there's just no way this other person is ever going to listen to anything that you say, you have to be willing to walk away and stop beating a dead horse. It just does no good for either party. Secondly, it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to say, I don't know. I know that's very hard, especially for us men where we really want to be right all the time. Even though women, I know you're always right, but men desire to be right. And it's hard for us as human beings to be like, man, either I was wrong or I don't know. We don't like that. I remember about 10 years ago, I definitely did not like that experience. Having to say, I don't know, but it was necessary. It was necessary to say, I don't know. Regardless of what belief system that you fall into, whether it be Mennonite brethren, Catholic, Baptist, whatever, atheist, if you don't know, you don't know. Plain and simple. Have the courage to go and look it up. Say, I don't know, but I will get back to you. Not only does that tell the person that, okay, this person is humble and is not willing to make up weird things that may or may not be true, He's, they are willing to go back and do the research. And then if you come back to them, that's even better. Because they, that person realized, wow, this person meant what they said. That they would go and research it and come back. And again, that just builds up respect amongst your community. Be willing to say, I don't know. And go to good resources. Go to the, go to the library, look it up in, in a book. The internet can be very dangerous. So, my third point. Yes, that is my third point. Anyways... That's embarrassing. <laughs> We've all been there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, again, I thank you all for having me here. And again, 
I realize this is a great diverse community and it's become even more diverse in the last 10 years since I was here. And my hope is that there will be some interreligious dialogue that can be had. And if you find yourself in such a discussion and don't realize what to do, hopefully something has hit home here and maybe you realize, oh, maybe that's why this didn't work out with this person. That's my hope. That's my hope. And this is such a simple thing because not only is it a matter of uh, talking with people of other faiths, but it will even come into play when you get married. If you get married, like myself. If you get married. Gentlemen, we're always looking for priests, just so you know. If you're thinking about the priesthood, come talk to me. When you get married, it's very often that you guys won't see eye to eye all the time. And so even this, these simple things, having a foundation, having respect, knowing when to walk away, is very important. It applies to such a broad range of life. And it's something, like I said at the beginning, that can, take, that can be taken for granted because we, get, we become stubborn and not being, will, not being willing to change. I ask you, my brothers and sisters, be willing to change. Be willing to take the higher and untraveled road when it comes to talking with somebody else. I hope this has been somewhat helpful. If it hasn't, well, I'm sorry I wasted 25 minutes of your life. Um, But, again, I thank you for having me here. Tabor has always and has been and always will be a great part of my life. It's very interesting to see the different people that are here still. Dr. Gray was one of my professors. Brad was my choir director. I mean, he has been for the last 20 years, so he has generations. And like Dan Sigley, he and I were in the same class, if you know him. So, and then Emily Olson, who works over in the president's office, she and I, she's one year older. So, those are the few people that I still remain here that I still know. Again, I thank you, and I hope you have a blessed day. Let us end in prayer.